Hello and welcome back to the second part of section 2.5. Uh, if you recall, we were dealing with the zeros of polynomial functions. If you remember back to the first example that we did, we came up with zeros that had complex zeros. Now, within those complex zeros, if you notice, we actually had the conjugates. So if we had an a plus bi, then we also had a zero at a minus bi. And that's exactly what the conjugate zeros and conjugate pairs rule says. It says that if we have a polynomial function that has real coefficients, and we know that a plus bi is a zero of a function, then we can automatically assume, or we should also know, that a minus bi is also a zero of the function. So, example six says to find a third degree polynomial with integer coefficients that has two 7i and negative 7i as the zeros. So what I would do is I would start out with the complex pieces first. You know that x equals 7i and x equals a negative 7i. Well, we need to convert these over to factors. If x equals 7i, then that means that x minus 7i was a factor. And likewise, if x equals a negative 7i is a 0, then we know that x plus 7i is also a factor. And while we're doing this, we also might as well deal with x equals 2. So this tells us that x minus 2 is also a 0. Now we'll deal with this one here in a second. Right now I want to deal with the complex zeros first. And the reason is, is if I deal with those first and I multiply those two together, I'm going to get rid of my complex numbers. So I have x plus 7i, and I'm going to multiply that by x minus 7i. When we do that, we end up with x squared minus 7i plus 7i and then minus 7i squared. Well, our positive and negative 7i's in the middle are going to cancel out. I hope you remember that i squared is really a negative 1. So this gives us x squared, and a negative 7 times a negative 1 will give us plus 7. So I have x squared plus 7 as a factor, and then I'm going to multiply that by x minus 2. And when we do that, we end up with x cubed minus 2x squared plus 7x minus 14. So now I have a third degree polynomial that utilized the zeros of 2 and plus or minus 7i. So I've just completed example 6. We have another uh, kind of general rule for factors of polynomials. It says for every polynomial of degree n greater than 0, in other words, if we have a positive uh, degree and we have real coefficients, that we can write these as a product of linear and quadratic factors where the quadratic factors have no real zeros. So just like in the previous example where we ended up with the x squared plus 7, that was a quadratic factor that had no real zeros, but we could still write it as a quadratic factor. Now, if we have a quadratic factor that has no real zeros, then we say that these are prime or irreducible over the reals, these, that type of a factor is. So example 7 tells us to find all the zeros of x cubed minus 4x squared plus 21x minus 34. And we are given that 1 plus 4i is a 0 of f, okay? Now notice that that says a 0 and not a factor. So what that tells me then is that x is equal to 1 plus 4i. And if you recall, we just talked about these complex conjugates that if 1 plus 4i is a 0, then I also have 
1 minus 4i as a 0 as well. So now I need to turn these into factors. So to turn these to factors, I need to set the entire equation equal to 0, which means that I end up with x minus 1 minus 4i equals 0. So this right here is my factor. And then I also have x minus 1 plus 4i as a factor. So two of my factors can be written as x minus 1 minus 4i and x minus 1 plus 4i. Now if I go ahead and I group my real pieces together, which would be the x minus 1 in both cases because the plus and minus 4i are the complex pieces and I treat these as two products of binomials because this is my real piece and this is my complex piece just like this is my real piece and this is my complex piece so if I go ahead and multiply those together I'm going to multiply my real pieces and you can foil this the whole thing if you foil you get your middle terms to be a plus 4i times x minus 1 and minus 4i times x minus 1. So the middle terms are going to cancel. So essentially what we're going to end up with is x minus 1, the quantity squared, and let's just go ahead and we'll factor it as a binomial, plus 4i times a quantity of x minus 1 minus 4i times a quantity of x minus 1 minus 16i squared. So again, as we mentioned earlier, your middle terms are going to cancel because you have a plus and a minus of each. And we're left with x minus 1, the quantity squared, minus 16. Well, I'm multiplying that 16 by i squared, which is a negative 1. So negative 16 times a negative 1 really becomes a plus 16. So if I go and simplify this, I'm now left with x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus 16, which gives us x squared minus 2x plus 17. Now this is my quadratic factor. And because it's quadratic, I need to go until I find a cubic function. So I'm going to take and do long division. And I'm going to use my quadratic factor that I just found. So x squared plus 2x plus 17. And I'm going to divide my original function, which was x cubed minus 4x squared plus 21x minus 34 by that quadratic factor. So to do that, x squared goes into x cubed x times. That's going to give us x cubed. And this here should be a minus, not a plus, because we had the minus up here. So negative 2x times x will give us a negative 2x squared and 17 times x will give us plus 17x. Hug that with parentheses, slap a negative on it, and distribute. So now my x cubes cancel. I'm left with a negative 2x squared plus 4x, and then I'm going to bring down that 34. And I start the whole process over again. x squared goes into a negative 2x squared, minus 2 times to give us negative 2x squared. Negative 2x times a negative 2 will give us plus 4x. And 17 times 2 will give us a negative 34. Hug it with parentheses, slap a negative, distribute that negative, plus, minus, plus, make this an addition. These cancel out. These are going to cancel, and these are going to cancel to leave you with a remainder of 0. So what that tells us then is our linear factor is x minus 2 and our quadratic factor 
is x squared minus 2x plus 17. Now our original function said to find all of the zeros. So our zeros are x equals 2, and then we have the 1 plus 4i, as well as the 1 minus 4i that was given. Now that completes our problem. So now example 8 says to write f of x as the product of linear factors and list the zeros. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use our rational zero test, which is p divided by q. That's going to give us plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, and plus or minus 8, all divided by plus or minus 1. So my possible zeros are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, and plus or minus 8. So I have a total of 8 real zeros possible. Now if we use our calculator to help us out, I found that I have 1 0 at x equals 1, so I'm going to use synthetic division with that, and I have 1, 0 x to the fourth terms, 1 x cubed term, 2 x squared terms, a negative 12 x terms, and 8 constant terms. So I'm going to bring my 1 down. This gives me 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 4, negative 8, negative 8, and 0. Or I end up with x to the 4th plus x cubed plus 2x squared minus, I'm sorry, plus 4x minus 8 equals 0. So, again, I'm going to use my calculator, and you can either graph your original function and look for another 0, or you can go ahead and graph this function and find the zeros of that. So if I do synthetic division again, I'm going to use my coefficients 1, 1, 2, 4, negative 8. I see that I have another 0 at x equals a negative 2, so I'm going to bring negative 2 out here, pull my 1 down, and I've got 1, negative 2, negative 1, 2, 4, negative 8, negative 4, 8, and 0. So now for a function, this produces my remainder, my constant, x squared cubed. So I have x cubed minus x squared plus 4x minus 4 equals 0. So right now my zeros are at x minus 1, x plus 2, and x cubed minus x squared plus 4x minus 4. We can actually group this factor here. So when we do that, let's just look at this right here. I can factor a x cubed out of, I'm sorry, an x squared out of the first term. So I have x squared times x minus 1, and I can factor a 4 out of that term. So I have plus 4 times x minus 1. So then this is going to give me x minus 1, which is the common factor between each term, and then I'm left with x squared plus 4. Now, this is also being multiplied by x plus 2 and x minus 1. Now, because this problem wanted linear factors, this term, this term, and this term, these are all linear factors. However, this one here is not. So let's see what x, what x actually equals at this factor. So if I solve for this, I end up with x equals the square root of a negative 4, which if you recall, that's really i 
times the square root of 4, or i times the square root of 4 is 2, so that gives me plus or minus 2i. So I can rewrite that factor now as, and let me write the first ones first, so we end up with x minus 1 times x plus 2 times x minus 1 times x plus 2i times x minus 2i. And I'm getting these two factors from this right here. These are all linear factors now. The only other thing we have to do is actually write the zeros. And that means that x is equal to 1, negative 2, 1 which I've already gotten here, and plus or minus 2i. So these are all of the zeros of this problem. Now, we have another test to kind of help us narrow down the types of zeros that we're going to get. If you recall, when we go and we do the rational zero test, this gives us plus or minus a list of numbers. Now what this um, rule of signs is going to give us is it's going to tell us whether we have positive real zeros or negative real zeros. We can identify if we have real zeros by looking at the number of variations in the sine of f of x. Our positive real zeros are going to equal the number of variations in sines or be less than that number by an even integer. So in other words, if I have six variations in sines, and we're going to look at this in a second, but if I have six, then that means I can have either six positive real zeros or the less than that number by an even integer would be two or four positive real zeros because two and four is less than six by an even integer. Now, on the other side, if I have a negative real zero, I have to look at the number of variations in the sine of f of a negative x. So in other words, I'm changing the sine of the x value and that's going to equal, be equal to the number of variations of f of negative x or less than that number by an even integer. And when we're talking about variation in signs, we're talking about two consecutive coefficients and if I go from plus to a minus, that's a variation of sine. If I'm going plus plus or minus minus, that is not a variation of sine. So let's look at an example to see what this looks like. Example 9 wants us to describe the possible real zeros of this function of f. So for the positive real zeros, we're going to look at the variations of sine. So I have a negative to a positive, a positive to a negative, and a negative to a positive. This gives me three variations in signs. So I'm going to put three delta um, plus or minus for three changes in sign. Okay, so that means I can have either three positive zeros or three minus two, because two was the next even integer, um, that would give me one positive zero. So either all three are going to be positive or I'll have at least one positive zero. Now to look at the negatives, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in a negative x. So I have to evaluate f of x at a negative x. And this is going to give me a negative 2 times a negative x cubed plus 5 times a negative x squared minus a negative x plus 8. So when I go to simplify this, this gives me a negative x to the third is going to give me a negative x cubed and a negative x cubed times a negative 2 is going to give me a positive 2x cubed. Plus a negative x squared is going to give me a positive x squared. So that's going to give me 5x squared. And I have a negative negative x, which is going to give me plus x plus 8. So if I go and I look, I have no sign changes there, none there, and none there. So I have no sign changes. And because I have no sign changes, this tells me that I have no negative zeros. So if I do my rational zero test and I see that I have plus or minus four or five numbers or whatever I've got, I can now go and eliminate 
all of the negative possibilities because I have no sign changes right here. And because I have no sign changes in my f of negative x, that means I have no negative zeros. And actually, if you graph, you'll see that you have no negative zeros. You only have one positive zero in this case. Now, the last test that we're going to have is what we call the upper and lower bound rules. Now, if we have a polynomial with real coefficients and a positive leading coefficient, and we can divide this polynomial by some factor x minus c using synthetic division, if c is a number that is greater than 0, and in the last row of our synthetic division, we have all positive numbers, then c is what we're going to call an upper bound. In other words, if I have a list of numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, and I look at 3, and we determine 3 to be our upper bound, then that means I can eliminate 4 as being a 0. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of eliminating numbers on either side if I can. Now if this c value is less than 0, and the numbers in the last row alternate from positive to negative and negative to positive, then we say that c is our lower bound. And we're going to look at an example of this as well. So for example 10, we have to find all the real zeros. Now if we're going to find all the real zeros, we're going to start it with a rational zero test, which is p divided by q. My factors are 3 are going to be plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 3. My factors of q are going to be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, and plus or minus 8. So my list of possible real zeros will be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 1 half, plus or minus 1 fourth, plus or minus 1 eighth, plus or minus 3 halves, plus or minus 3 fourths, and plus or minus 3 eighths. So this is a list of all of the zeros that this function can contain. So to use the upper and lower bound rules, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my variations of sign, and I see that I have a positive to a negative, a negative to a positive, and a positive to a negative. So I have three sign changes. This tells me I'll either have three positive zeros or one positive zero. To determine if I have any negative zeros, I'm going to evaluate f of a negative x, which gives me 6 times a negative x cubed minus 4 times a negative x squared plus 3 times a negative x minus 2. And if I simplify this, I end up with a negative 6x cubed minus 4x squared minus 3x minus 2. And because I have no sign changes, this tells me I have no negative zeros. So because I have no negative zeros, now I can come back up here to this list and I can eliminate all of these negative signs here. So that just reduced my list to half of the zeros I have to look at. Now let's go ahead and use our calculator to find one of those real zeros. And when I do that, I see that x is equal to 1. So I'm going to use synthetic division. So I have 1, and then I've got 6, negative 4, 3, and negative 2 for my original function. This is going to give me 6, 6, 2, 2, 5, 5, and 3. And because my bottom row has all positive entries or no sign changes, I know that x equals 1 is an upper bound. So what that does then is if I come up here to my original list again, I can get rid of any number that is greater than 1. So I can get rid of 3, and I can get rid of 1 and a half. So now I've eliminated a couple more of my factors to try to eliminate this process. 
And if you graph this, you will find that your function f of x is equal to the quantity of x minus 2 thirds times the quantity of 6x squared plus 3. So your real only real x is when x is equal to a positive 2 thirds because this one here is not going to produce a real zero. And that concludes example our last example here. And this is the last example of section 2.5. So your fun fact in honor of complex number is this cartoon. With that, have a good night, and we'll see you guys tomorrow.